twelfth meeting, Friday, June twenty first, nineteen seventy four. Discussion in the morning. First question, woman two. I have done anabhanasati, knowing the outgoing breath and knowing the incoming breath, but I have found that my jitta cannot get calm. It felt as if it was about to enter a door, but it did not enter. Answer. If you follow the breath in and then back out again, this is the kind of result that's produced. You should define the breath at that point where it is felt most clearly. You should feel that the breath is entering or leaving at that one spot, passing by that one point. If you do it in this way, you will not feel as if you are going in and out of a door, as you said. Second question, woman three. My mind is the same as that of the first questioner, in that I am anxious and concerned for other people. It is difficult to take hold of my mind and make it stay in one place so as to get calm. How should I correct it? Answer: As soon as you realize that the mind has gone out to other people, it stops. Then you can set up the mind once again to do the practice. As soon as you realize that it has gone out again, it stops, allowing you to call it back in to do the work that you have set it to do. When you make it return often, it will tend to remain. Then you can attain calm. Thamma talk in the evening. To begin with, Thanajan talked with those Thai people who had come. He talked about people who wrongly make a living off Buddhism, such as those who get photographs and pictures of various Ajans and sell them. After this, he gave the following talk to everyone who had come. Just now we were speaking about those who do harm to Buddhism, either intentionally or unintentionally. Things that are wrong now have always been wrong. They may appear to come from many different sources, but truly speaking, they arise only in the heart. A great deal of deceptiveness exists in each of our hearts, including my own. Previously, my heart was like that, but eventually I came to realize it by virtue of my training in mindful awareness. Which helped me to constantly study the state of my mind. Thus, I was able to know which things are deceptive and which are true. Mostly, the mind creates only false things, which we deludedly go after without being in the least aware that they are super deceptions. In fact, we believe them to be entirely true, so we trust them and go after them without putting up any resistance in order to test this kind of thinking. For example, a person sits in meditation, and in the first several seconds, he feels that it is true. He fixes his attention on butto, butto, and he feels that it is the true butto for four or five seconds. But by the time he reaches one minute, all the false things start to flow from the jitta more and more. This gives rise to thoughts of children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren. Which branch out and spread everywhere, but all of it is deception. Meanwhile, the word butto has disappeared from awareness, leaving only the emotionally charged objects and situations, aramana, that he is used to thinking about, which have always deceived him. They drag him away without him being aware of it. Once he has allowed these false things to capture his attention, he becomes engrossed in them. Butto then disappears. And Anna Banasati goes silent, even though he is still breathing. It is silent as regards paying attention, silent as regards the way of fixing his attention with determination and with mindfulness. All this has disappeared into silence. As soon as he is able to recollect himself, he says, "I have done meditation for long enough, but I do not see any good results arise whatsoever." Why is that? It is right that thoughts of this sort should arise, but then he goes wrong again. In other words, thinking like this implies that he sees his faults, but he does not think the reason I did not get good results was that I did not practice correctly. Thinking like this would call his attention to the fact that he should have mindfulness, yet he returns to his previous state of delusion, again saying. I have sat for a long time, so I think I'll rest for a short while, 
After I get up, I will really have a go at it. But he does not sleep just for a short while. He sleeps deeply until the sun comes up, and when he wakes, oh goodness! The next day he does it again, so he goes on continually fooling himself. The next day he starts off with five seconds, and the next day four seconds, and so on, getting steadily worse. This is the way of those who deceive themselves. Apart from this, he also harms himself, saying, Here, I have been practicing meditation for a long time, and I do not see that I have gained any virtue, so why should I go on doing this meditation? It is most likely that I am a person with unfortunate tendencies of character who has little merit and little virtue in the way of Pum of the Lord Buddha. If I continue doing this, it will not lead to anything of value, so it will be only a waste of time. It is better to stop entirely, and so on, without ever really considering whether stopping meditation is a good thing. If it was truly good, then people all over this world who never do any meditation ought to be good people since long ago. Again, one can think, how can stopping be better than doing meditation? If I stop simply because I have not seen good results, in what way will it truly be better? From what did the lack of results come? Just from myself. I am constantly cheating myself. Of all false things, the most important ones are those within yourself. Deceiving yourself is a very important problem which you should examine and investigate. All of you have been cheated and deceived enough already. Perhaps the first three or four seconds of meditation are good, but the next three or four are not. When you become aware of this, you should establish mindfulness on the practice again, and continue to re-establish your mindfulness over and over again. Then the time will come when you know at once when the jitta displays anything that goes in the wrong direction. You will begin to know what is going against your intended purpose. When you know that, you will re-establish mindfulness and focus the jitta on the practice anew. With full awareness, you must focus on the practice again and again until eventually your awareness is continuous. As soon as you determine to practice truly and properly, the false side of you will probably do so as well. In other words, the gilesas wait and try to get in during those times when you are off guard and unmindful. Once you have established your determination and your direction firmly, the gilesas give way. But when I say give way, it should not be understood to mean that they give up and lie down like we do. They give way waiting and watching for a chance to get back at you. When they see an opportunity, they pounce on you quicker than a cat catching a rat. Then they disappear again and crouch silently. They wait to hit you again when you are off guard. If you are vigilant, they do nothing, but when you become overconfident about your vigilance, they are sure to be encouraged to move again. Thus you are continually cheated probably every time. So it is important to search for a method and a suitable place to do the work of reforming yourself. This will help you practice diligently in many directions using many methods, like the ones I have written about in the biography of Venerable Ajahn Man, or in Bhadibhada, or in the book called Forest Thamma. The life of a bhikkhu is different from that of a layperson. Wherever bhikkhus go to practice, their life is convenient and comfortable, because they have only one duty, meditation. Like when they venture into the forests and hills, and live in frightening places where there are various types of fierce animals such as tigers, bears, and snakes. When bhikkhus go to stay in such places, their attitude changes. For example, laziness in regard to maintaining effort gradually diminishes. Their vigilance increases, and as soon as they encounter a critical situation, all laziness vanishes. When they are left with no way out and nowhere to escape to, mindfulness immediately takes charge and invigorates their determination to practice. The fear of death may cause them to break out in a sweat, but their mindfulness remains sharply focused. Sometimes a tiger roars repeatedly right by the path a bhikkhu is using for walking jungama. It does not come just to have a chat. This has, in fact, happened to me. It happened many times. How many, I don't know, but the tiger roaring there was no small cat. It was a big, striped tiger. At that moment, it seemed as if all my hair stood on end, and I felt I was shivering, even though it wasn't cold. 
but the jitta was not allowed to withdraw, so it revolved round and round until it descended to the heart. At that moment I entrusted my life to the Lord Buddha. Then there was just the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha to guard and preserve my heart. Once I had submitted my heart to the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha, then I was prepared for whatever happened. If my time to die had truly come, at least my jitta would not be careless and unguarded. I thought, while I live, may I have mindfulness so that I am not caught at a disadvantage. Should a tiger devour me, so be it. But I will not abandon the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha. As the jitta completely submitted to the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha, all longing ceased. The longing for life was no longer there. Attachment to the body disappeared, leaving only the jitta with single-minded focus on tamma. In a situation like that, fear disappears entirely. There is no trace of it left at all. The jitta converges and plunges straight down to the Lord Buddha, the tamma, and the sangha in the heart, completely. It seems then as if nothing can ever come to disturb one again. When the jitta plunges straight down like that, it becomes full of strength. All fear disappears, so that even if the tiger roars and comes right up to you, you may feel able to walk over and stroke it gently with mitta. There may be a feeling of close friendship with it, since both of you are companions in birth, old age, sickness, and death. Then there may not be even the slightest thought that the tiger is dangerous, or that it might harm you if you were to go and stroke it. When a situation like this occurs, only a feeling of intimacy and gentleness for it remains, since all fear has disappeared. There are many methods for training and disciplining the jitta. Once you find a good basis, something which you can recollect to reflect upon, you may bring up this basis and put it into practice any time. Then, whenever you find yourself in a situation where you are cornered and at your wit's end, that method which has produced good results for you in the past will immediately come to you. If you act like a warrior every time you confront a dangerous situation, you are bound to gain an important lesson from it. Unless, that is, you hesitate at the critical moment and cannot make up your mind. If the jitta is uncertain and vacillates because it cannot commit itself, then you might go mad. But when the jitta truly accepts the situation, Nothing can overpower the jitta that is attached to tamma, so that the two are as one. There will also be a certainty at that time that nothing can do you any harm, whether it is a tiger or any other danger in the world. You will not be afraid of anything at all. Thus the jitta and tamma, when they fuse together as one, have power over everything else in the world. For this reason, Tamma is superior in the three worlds of existence. In truth, the power of the jitta is greater than anything else in this world. Training in the way I have just mentioned will help you to find that out. You will also learn about what is false within yourself. If you live in normal surroundings and do not go to places where you are cornered with no way out, the master of deceit will invade and overpower you, destroying everything. When you do encounter a situation where you are cornered with no way out, instead of you being always under pressure, you are the one putting the pressure on the internal master of deceit. If you do put pressure on it, even only once, you will know the truth about the jitta and the one who deceives the jitta in a way that you will never forget. When tamma reaches and enters the jitta, you can then speak of these things with authority because the experience makes a powerful impression on your jitta. When the person who trains himself to the utmost willingly entrusts his life to tamma with complete commitment, the results are truly satisfying. Victory over the master of deceit is a truly amazing experience, one that you will never forget for the rest of your life. If the jitta has never realized its true power in a time of necessity, it will not know its own significance, so you will always take refuge in other people. The Lord Buddha's saying, Atahi atano na to, self is the refuge of self, has yet to be accepted by the heart. But whenever something happens that makes you realize the heart's true power, you will then believe the tamma saying, Atahi atano na to, in a way that truly impresses the heart. 
the jitta that penetrates to the truth when it is at an impasse with no way out, such as when you have a fever and pain overpowers you, or when you sit in meditation for a long time, or when you meet with a life-threatening incident, is a jitta that knows its own strength. If you are a true spiritual warrior, the jitta revolves around internally without hoping for any external support. That is when the jitta comes to see its own significance at all times. This is a most wonderful experience, for if you can get past those life-threatening incidents, you will probably have no anxiety in regard to life and death. Concern about painful feeling when it arises, and the anxiety associated with dying, how you will be able to withstand the pain, where you will be reborn after you die, fear that you have wasted your life and so will be at a disadvantage in the next life, none of these concerns will arise in the jitta at all. In other words, when your life reaches a critical juncture, the jitta and mindfulness immediately go inward and find each other so as to enter the battlefront. Since you have fought and won such battles before, death will present no problems for you, because mindfulness and wisdom will quickly take charge and lead the way. When death approaches, mindfulness and wisdom join forces. They are not likely to flee or to withdraw, but will immediately spin round and go in to confront the situation. Then, whether you live or die, you are not willing to be a slave of the master of deceit. Rather, by relying on your faith in Tamma and your faith in yourself, you will seek to know the truth at that moment. Faith in Tamma is to be found right here. Where else can you find faith in Tamma? The scriptures tell the truth, but if you do not find the truth of Tamma in your own heart, you will have no firm evidence to confirm the truth and give you confidence. But when you encounter a dangerous situation which allows you to see the truth quite clearly, then the truth you experience does not differ from the truth of Tamma that is revealed in the scriptures. When faced with a critical situation, none of the sages like to stay where there were many people and much disturbance. They like to find a place that suits them and their manner of practice. Mostly they succeed in gaining results by living in isolated or lonely places, isolated both in body and heart. People like us do not act like that. As soon as we begin to feel ill, you know how it is. Oh, where are all my children? Where are all my grandchildren? This child is not looking after me. My grandchildren are not paying any attention to me. Where have they all gone? Where have all my relations and friends disappeared to? What's happening? It's not good for them all to go and lose all interest in me. Do they dislike me? Nobody has any sympathy for me. I'm about to die, and nobody even turns to look at me. The jitta gets increasingly troubled, but we cannot find any basis to grasp hold of so as to reduce it by ourselves. Previously, my husband and I lived happily together, but now that I am truly about to die, I don't see his face here at all. My husband is bad, my children are bad, my grandchildren are bad, everyone is bad, but the badness is really from her own heart. The filth that's there is brought out and thrown about externally, making everything filthy. The filth in her heart comes from her fear of death. Her inadequacy in the face of death is what goes about throwing filth at other people and venting discontent. This is what is meant by having nothing as a basic principle in the heart. We never think about no nato, for our refuge is entirely based in other people. As soon as we are born, we begin taking refuge in other people. When we are born, we must of necessity depend on other people, such as our mother, our father, our nursemaids, one person after another, until we come to teachers, professors, and so on. Once we become dependent on others, we want to go on taking refuge in other people until the day we die without ever having the least thought of taking refuge in ourselves. This makes it very difficult for us to establish any basic principles within our hearts at all. The Lord Buddha taught that we should take refuge in ourselves. We should only depend on other people as a means of gaining the strength we need to be able to take refuge in ourselves in the future. This is an important principle that Buddhists should constantly keep in mind. Various lessons are taught by mother and father, others by teachers and professors, and others by the Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha. We should take the knowledge and understanding that we have learned and diligently put them into practice in order to find a way to help ourselves. When we realize the significance of ourselves, other things seem unimportant, so we let go of them all. Such is the way of someone who is trained in the practice of Buddhist meditation. 
when our situation becomes critical, we will want to be left alone, away from involvement with friends and relatives or anyone else. Our duty at that time will be clear, to let the jitta whirl round and go down inside. There should be no longing or yearning for anything in this world. Earth, water, air, fire, we have examined them all, and seen quite clearly that everything in the physical world is composed of elements. We give them names such as body, clothes, house, and so on, endlessly, but things of this nature are not really stable. In the end, they are going to simply disintegrate and break up. The mindfulness and wisdom which we have developed in meditation separate out the elements, tadu, and kantas with complete clarity. Everything is examined fully in the light of truth. Then the jitta is true, the elements are true, feeling, vedana, memory, sanya, thought, sankara, and consciousness, vinyarna, are all true. Everything is true in its own sphere, so there is no disturbance, and we can pass beyond contentedly. Sugato, well gone. There is no longer anything to cause us trouble or disturbance. We no longer create dukkha and difficulty for ourselves or others, so we enjoy supreme happiness and contentment. When you die, there is no need to invite bhikkhus to the funeral to chant kusala tamma a kusala tamma, thereby disturbing everyone. This is what I constantly tell the people who come to see me at Wat Babantad. Adan Mahabua speaks with certainty in this matter. Whoever wants Guzalatthamma should develop it within themselves. After someone has died, those who are still living go about inviting bhikkhus to give merit and Guzalatthamma. They chase after the bhikkhus who have gone into the forests and wild places, which is all a disturbing nuisance. Instead, they should search for Guzala, skillfulness of heart and mind, within themselves while they are still alive, until they get enough. That is a method that will bring happiness and contentment to us right now in this life. It's no use to wait until after we have died to invite bhikkhus to come and chant Gusala which merely becomes a nuisance to the bhikkhus. That is contrary to the purpose of Buddhism, which teaches people to be clever in searching for what is good and to make that a part of themselves while they are still alive, so that when they die they are sugato, free of worry. I have been ordained for many vassa already, and I am still developing just Kusala Tamma. So when Adan Mahabua dies, please do not invite bhikkhus to come and chant at his funeral. Please don't make trouble for them. If Adan Mahabua is still stupid after developing Kusala Tamma from the beginning of his practice until now, then he is beyond help anyway, so let him sink alone. But do not let other people come and become stupid also. In saying this, I am speaking bluntly. This is the way I talk to my followers, and it is the truth. I am never concerned about anything. When the time comes to relinquish this body and mind, I will relinquish it with pleasure, and die entirely free from anxiety. The whole world embraces body and mind. When the time comes to die and abandon them, there is sadness, sorrow, and grief everywhere, because people do not want to accept death. When the body is dying, they want it to live. And when the time for death has come, they do not want to go. The Lord Buddha taught us the simple truth, when the time to go has come, then go. But when the time to go has not yet come, then live. So, if there are any sweet drinks, bring them here. While I am still living, I will drink them. But when I am about to die, don't come and be a nuisance, for then I will relinquish everything, this entire heavy burden. Para hawe pansa kandha. Having relinquished everything in the true natural way, one passes on contentedly and comes to ultimate fulfillment. The Lord Buddha was like that, and so were the Zavakas. We have followed the footprints of the Lord Buddha. How else could it be? Without doubt it must be this way. The hearts of beings in this world are whirling about in the round of samsara, carrying all the defilements that lead them again and again to birth and death endlessly. So please, all of you, try to make your hearts become free from the round of samsara. Then you will be absolutely contented, as there will be no need to go round and round. From tomorrow I shall no longer be here, for I must return to Thailand. I will think of all my brothers and sisters here. I came here to England only for the purpose of helping people in their spiritual practice. I did not come for any worldly purposes at all. 
Wherever I go, I never think of going for the sake of goods or money or wealth, but I go for the sake of people's hearts, so that they may gain something of value. In coming to England, I also have a feeling of fullness in my heart in the same way. Intentions are more important than anything else. If your intentions are good, everything else will be good as well. But if your intentions are not good, everything is spoilt and goes wrong accordingly. Therefore, in coming to visit my brothers and sisters in London, I came with good intentions. And when I go, I shall think of your good intentions. Perhaps we shall meet again, either here or in Thailand. In other words, you may go to visit us out there, or we may come to visit you here. This is enough explanation of Tamma for today, so I will stop. Those of you who have anything in your hearts that you want to ask may do so now. Tomorrow there will be no time in the morning, for we will eat early and then must go. Questions and Answers First Question Man 1 If we practice Tamma until we know that we have Dukkha continually going on and on, what result will we get? Answer Usually you see dukkha in those things which cause great difficulties. Those things that cause you pleasure are seen to be sulkha. As soon as the conditions that cause pleasure change, you see that as dukkha, but you don't have the wisdom to cure that dukkha. Finally, you lie down submerged in suffering with no interest in searching for the way out, because you consider that trying to search for the way out from dukkha is difficult. Therefore you must submit to dukkha being your friend all the time. The training and practice of Tamma so as to know Dukkha as it truly is consists of using meditation and wisdom to examine how to train the Jitta so that you can extract the Gilesas that cause Dukkha and so find the taste of happiness in the Jitta. This is bound to help you find true and genuine happiness, giving you a basic principle to hold firmly in the heart no matter what the circumstances are. Second question, Woman 1. When we meditate using Bhutto, is it necessary to be seated in meditation? Answer. You can do it in all postures. The Lord Buddha did not teach people in order to put them into a tight fix when they are struggling with their gilesas. He taught people to use skill and cleverness so as to always be victorious. We should therefore search for clever ways to be the victor following the Lord. The Tamma that I have explained to you here is 95% forest Tamma. I have explained the importance of meditation as a means of keeping the focus of the jitta within, so please don't let the jitta go out externally. By nature, the jitta likes to focus outwardly. Constantly doing the buddho meditation can help a great deal in curing this problem. <laughs>